Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all. And um, you can see the upcoming uh, topics for Grand Rounds. We're starting to drift away from uh, exclusively being oriented toward COVID-19, which hopefully is a good sign despite uh, some of the things that Brian just told us. Um, well, this morning, it gives me great pleasure to introduce <clears throat> this morning's uh, Medical Grand Round speaker, Dr. Tushar Desai. Tushar received his BA at Amherst College, his MD and MPH degrees at Tufts. He did his internal medicine residency at Michigan before going to Boston Medical Center for his pulmonary critical care fellowship. We were able to lure him to the West Coast where he did his postdoctoral fellowship with Mark Krasnow at Stanford where he received outstanding training as a developmental biologist and uh, is now an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine. He has accumulated significant leadership roles and honors. He's a standing member of the Lung Injury Repair and Remodeling Study Section at the NIH, a scientific advisory member for the ATS, uh, American Lung Association Lung Force Gala honoree, which was a big deal up in San Francisco a couple of years ago. He's the Robert A. and Gertrude T. Hudson Endowed Scholar. He is uh, NIH funded, a member of ASCII. He's the Director of Translational Lung Biology at Stanford University and Director of Graduate Studies for the Interdisciplinary Program for uh, Stem Cell Biology. His science focus on fundamental lung biology and lung injury includes uh, a really interesting work in pulmonary fibrosis and lung cancer, and we'll, we're, we'll hear about some of this today. With Para Arbery, he developed PUSH technology as a new platform for in situ tissue interrogation of molecular pathways and continues to develop new technologies. He has first and senior author publications in uh, top science journals, including Science, Nature, Cell, and eLife. I guess the t-shirt he's wearing today is the eLife t-shirt. Uh, he showed it to me. You get that for, for getting an article published there, he told me. And uh, he may, probably most importantly, he's just a wonderful person. He's a great mentor, physician, and colleague. And fortunately for all of us today, he also gives wonderful lectures. And with that, let me introduce Tushar and uh, ask him to go ahead and just take it away. Thanks, Mark. Um, let me just figure out how to share my screen. I think I can do that here. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you, Mark, uh, for the really nice introduction. And thanks everyone for um, showing up uh, early in the morning. Um, I hope you won't be disappointed. So I'm gonna talk today about some work we're doing on uh, repair of acute lung injury. So I don't have any disclosures uh, financially, except I will disclose this is not really a talk about ALI or ARDS, uh, or, or is it? You know, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll see at the end, there's some interesting uh, parallels. So uh, my lab uh, for a long time has been interested in basic lung biology uh, and using basic science to uh, understand the pathogenesis and progression of really important alveolar diseases so that we can rationally engineer uh, novel and effective therapies. You can see some of, probably many of you recognize uh, these different alveolar diseases shown here. Um, so we really we work on uh, what I call the business end of the lung, which is the gas exchange region. And you can see here in the schematic, <clears throat> you know, it's where the bron bronchioles end and you enter into the alveolar region. This is a vascular cast where you can see the pulmonary arterioles giving rise to the capillary meshwork uh, that underlies uh, these alveoli here uh, seen on the EM. And on the um, EM cross section, you can again see the bronchioles giving rise to the alveolar region. And you see this beautiful uh, kind of continuous honeycomb region, which is characteristic and, uh, and uh, provides the massive surface area for gas exchange. So, this uh, entire alveolar region is lined by a really simple and delicate uh, epithelial lining. And I just schematized it here on the left. In red are the alveolar type 1 cells, which are these incredibly flat cells that enable gas exchange and make up uh, over 97% of the surface area because of their, their width. Uh, and then in green are these cuboidal alveolar type 2 cells that secrete surfactant phospholipid uh, that minimizes the surface tension to prevent collapse during breathing. And here is an EM where you can see uh, 
uh, overlying this mesh of capillaries are, are, is this uh, epithelium. And so here are a couple of alveolar type two cells with their microvilli that you can see. And then uh, the alveolar type one cells, you can just see the junction marked here by the arrow. So these are incredibly broad uh, cells that are spread out <clears throat> and really wide compared to the type two cells. Uh, I'd like to show this to just to remind everyone how incredibly thin the surface area is. This is um, a cross section where you see an alveolar type two cell uh, up here and you see in asterisks marking the cytoplasm of alveolar type one cells. And this is a capillary vessel with red blood cells with the And you can see compared to the size of an erythrocyte how incredibly thin the type one cell is. Um, this is kind of cool. This is from a, a image from Nick Yule in my lab where he imaged a single alveolar type one cell in mouse lung. And I'll just show it to you. It's really kind of a remarkable cell type. You've got these, uh, these holes or pores that are actually go through the cell to provide collateral ventilation between uh, one alveolus and the neighboring one. And you can just see how incredibly uh, spread out the cell is. Okay, so <clears throat> the lung uh, is an epithelial barrier, which really provides the interface between, uh, between the body and, and the external environment. And so I'm showing you through several different examples here of epithelial barriers. And you can see, you know, one of these is not like the others. You've got uh, stratified epithelia in the skin, esophagus, and part of the bladder, and the airways have a pseudostratified epithelium. And so these are sort of, um, you know, structurally dense uh, and <clears throat> multi-layered in the case of the stratified epithelium. And so they can provide an effective barrier uh, to injury uh, so that you, you're not as likely to get breaks. Now the alveoli, because of this requirement for being extremely thin to facilitate gas exchange, it doesn't benefit from the same structural stability of uh, other epithelia in the body. And uh, this is also significant because directly underneath the epithelium are these capillaries and uh, injuring the alveolar epithelium and the capillaries can lead to uh, uh, lung injury that can be, be severe and affect oxygenation. And so, um, of course, Throughout the lifetime, we're also exposed to many different, um, basically anything in the airborne environment. And this can include pathogens uh, like uh, COVID or uh, H1N1 influenza, particulate uh, matter exposure, for instance, in first responder firefighters and uh, bacterial infections. So there's a lot uh, that ha you have to, um, the lungs have to be prepared for. So we just wanted to ask a very simple question, which is <clears throat> how is the injured alveolar epithelium regenerated. Um, and I'm just going to give you here a background. This summarizes, you know, a, more than a decade of work uh, by me and also a, a lot of other people in the field. And this is kind of the current model for how uh, alveolar cells are replaced during aging, shown here on the left, where you have these uh, uh, a minor population of type 2 cells that function as stem cells. Uh, and these are actually WINT active. Uh, and marked by expression of a gene known as axon 2. So these Wnt active stem cells, they receive uh, Wnt ligand from the fibroblast next to them, and that allows them to be able to proliferate and subsequently generate new type 1 and type 2 cells. Now, with a, <clears throat> a massive injury, <clears throat> you can imagine having a uh, distributed rare population of stem cells may not facilitate sufficient repair. So actually, um, an interesting thing happens where uh, what, what I'm calling here bulk type 2 cells, which are not uh, type 2 stem cells, they can uh, they become active and wind signaling transiently and, and subsequently can proliferate and generate cells. So it's kind of like a backup uh, reserve system. Uh, and this, these are uh, referred to as facultative uh, stem cells where they are only operative under uh, conditions of uh, acute injury. So we wanted to... Um, you know, really just uh, focus on doing really clean injuries and specific injuries to examine the response and, and be able to kind of make sense of it. So many people in the field, including us in the past have done injuries, including bleomycin or hyperoxia or <clears throat> H1N1 infection. And this causes, you know, really severe damage and affects multiple cell types. And it's sort of hard to figure out uh, really precisely what, uh, what is going on. So we took advantage of mouse genetics. Uh, here's Mario Capecchi holding a, a beaker of blue liquid because they make you do that kind of stuff when they take your pictures. Uh, and 
Uh, he won the Nobel Prize, of course, for um, mouse genetics. And so we took advantage of the power of mouse genetics to try to really do some really precise experiments. So what we wanted to do first was we wanted to ablate type one cells and examine the type two cell regenerative response. So we used uh, here, I'm just gonna bear with me. This is the uh, you know basic science uh, part of the talk, but there's a recombinase called Cree, which is not expressed in uh, the human body, um, and, but it has very specific targets. And so uh, a lot of mouse transgenic experiments involve driving Cree recombinase in specific cell types. So here we can drive Cree recombinase only in type one cells. And then the targets of Cree recombinase in this case, uh, one is a fluorescent reporter where when Cree recombinase is present in a cell, it turns on expression of a green fluorescent protein so that you can visualize this, the marked cells under a microscope. At the same time in this strategy, we also uh, use the Cree recombinase to turn on constitutive expression of the diphtheria toxin receptor. And so <clears throat> in this mouse, we will have type one cells in the lung that are, have a green fluorescent protein and are also expressing the human diphtheria toxin receptor. So administering diphtheria toxin at different doses can give tunable specific ablation of type one cells without impacting on fibroblasts, inflammatory cells, or type two cells so that we can kind of cleanly uh, examine the dynamics of the, the repair response. This is just to show you because these are the kinds of pictures I'm gonna show you. This is what it looks like in this mouse uh, when you drive the green fluorescent protein, not only in type one cells, but in type two cells. And so I think you can appreciate these sort of raisin looking uh, green fluorescent protein marked cells. And these are the alveolar type two cells. And the alveolar type one cells gives this sort of green haze. And if you look and you just uh, sparsely mark alveolar type one cells, so you can kind of distinguish individual cells, you can see here on, a, on the section that here's a green type one cell that ends here, and here's another green type one cell that ends here. And this green fluorescent protein free space is actually an alveolar type two cell. So this is, these are the kinds of analyses we're doing is uh, doing the ablation and then looking at the fluorescence and staining for markers. So um, just to remind you of the current model in the field, when we went into this is that you have, for instance, if type one cell dies, this would stimulate duplication of uh, alveolar type two cells, uh, the stem cells, and that following duplication, uh, one of the daughters would differentiate or transdifferentiate into a type one cell. So you'd end up both uh, replacing the type one cell that was killed and uh, without depleting your type two cell in this situation. So here's, uh, here's our first run of the experiment. We uh, activate the green fluorescent protein and the toxin receptor expression uh, in the animal. And then we give the diphtheria toxin uh, at one time point and we wait two hours. And you can see here in the control lung, which has the green fluorescent protein, but lacks the diphtheria toxin receptor, there's no effect of the deuteria toxin. And you can see really pretty broad labeling uh, in green here of alveolar type one cells. And in red are the non-type one cells. So this includes type two cells, uh, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, et cetera. <clears throat> but when we look in the experimental animal that does have the deuteria toxin receptor, you can see a very little remaining green signal, but you see lots of red signal. And uh, so we've successfully gotten rid of uh, ablated a very significant number of alveolar type one cells. But to our surprise, the uh, alveoli actually looks pretty good here. If you just look, uh, there's, we don't see a lot of macrophages or inflammatory cells uh, within the lumen and architecturally looks pretty, pretty healthy, nice thin septi. Uh, incidentally, these animals also uh, look, they, they feel fine. They don't look short of breath or tachypnic or anything like that. And so initially we thought that we were not really ablating. Perhaps there was some malfunction in the system because even though we had killed apparently uh, most uh, of the type one cells, uh, the animal didn't blink an eye. So we then stained for cell type markers and you can see here in the control, this is two hours after the toxin. You can see here, this is uh, in the control of mouse. You can see the nuclei here marked in blue. You can see the non type one cells here in red. These are the green fluorescent protein marked type one cells. And this is uh, the marker RAGE, which uh, is specific for type one cells. And so you can see here, you've got beautiful co-localization of the RAGE and the GFP. And so this is just the healthy uh, alveolus. Now in the experimental animal, 
uh, we can see nicely that the uh, tomato expression in the non-type 1 cells, which were not harmed, uh, that looks fine. Uh, the green fluorescent protein is absent. But to our surprise, actually, <clears throat> we saw full coverage by uh, type 1 cells. So even though we had just two hours earlier administered diphtheria toxin and ablated uh, a really large proportion of the type 1 cells, they were completely replaced uh, in, in a very rapid uh, time scale. We next looked at uh, expression of a uh, protein called keratinate, and keratinate has been recently identified by uh, others as uh, being uh, turned on uh, in type 2 cells as they transdifferentiate into type 1 cells. Uh, this happens transiently, and people show this nicely in several models, including the bleomycin uh, lung injury model. So we said, okay, let's see what's happening with keratinate. And so in the control, you can see there's uh, there's soluble keratinate, uh, which is, is broadly expressed at the RNA level in type two cells, but you don't see much of a, uh, it's, it's soluble, so it hasn't really become filamentous. So you don't really see it at the protein level in type two cells, although it's there. Uh, 30 minutes after the diphtheria toxin, we see blazing um, pro keratinate uh, filamentous protein. And you can see that these type two cells marked by surfactant protein C here, are flattening out and have already flattened out pretty, pretty extensively, uh, 30 minutes uh, post-toxin. And at two hours post-toxin, it's more of the same where you see, in fact, uh, the cells have uh, flattened and, and you can no longer detect uh, surfactant protein C in many of these uh, uh, what were type two cells that have flattened out into uh, type one cells, it looks like. So, um, we then decided to do electron microscopy to look really again, look at this further and try to understand what's happening. So I'm showing you here first, this is an uh, EM of a, a healthy type one cell. And you can see that there's the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And as is very typical, you have uh, a fair amount of cytoplasm in the perinuclear area, but then you just send this little flat, uh, it's almost like a manta ray, you know, really thin projections out. Uh, and so this is a healthy type one cell. This on the top here with the black arrowheads is marking a dying type one cell, and it has the characteristic features of sort of the blebbing and the vacuoles uh, that have formed in the cytoplasm. And it's sort of lifting off the basement membrane. And down here as well in black, you can see uh, this uh, blebbing uh, dying type one cell. This looks like it's a macrophage in the area. And this is an alveolar type two cell, which we can tell because it has these microvilli projections and lamellar bodies that contain the surfactant. This is actually surfactant in the airway. And so what we saw was that we could find evidence of these <coughs> transdifferentiating uh, alveolar type two cells. And they had a couple of features. One is that they were very um, sort of transparent. So you can see here, it's relatively white compared to uh, a healthy type, normal type one membrane. And in here, actually, you can see these are lamellar bodies. So this is a type two cell that is really rapidly uh, flattened and uh, adopted the uh, morphological features uh, of a type one cell. It, partly, in, in this case, it's not quite flat yet. Uh, the other remarkable thing is that um, we looked throughout the lung and we could never really find evidence of denudation where we didn't find any areas that were ab absent of a type one cell. And we always saw junctions that were, uh, we could, you know, very, very visible between uh, the, the newly forming type uh, one cells and type two cells. And I like this picture because it demonstrates that here you have an alveolar type two cell here in the middle. And this is an alveol, a newly <coughs> flattening type two cell that has a tight junction here in black. You can see it's a little bit more dense with this neighboring type two cell. And there's also a new type one cell on the other side of this type two cell. And you can see the junction here. So we call this gap-free epithelial remodeling. And it's really quite, um, it's quite remarkable. And so I think this is probably an important feature because of the uh, nearness of the capillary endothelium. There may be some really important uh, reason why you uh, don't want to let gaps or wounds form or stay around for too long, at least uh, with an acute injury. So just to um, recap what, what I've told you so far is that <clears throat> we think that when you have uh, type one cell ablation, <clears throat> rather than getting the self-duplication and then subsequent trans differentiation, you get immediate 
transdifferentiation of a non-stem cell of this bulk type two cell that just immediately flattens out and regenerates the type one cell to restore very rapidly and in this gap-free manner, the alveolar epithelium. So we also looked at uh, the number of type one versus type two cells and sort of as expected, we saw that in the toxin-treated animal, the number of type two cells underwent a significant reduction uh, at a two hour time point, whereas the number of type one cells was unchanged. So it really seems to be well balanced. You just very quickly replace all the type one cells that have, have been ablated. When we then started to look at the kinetics of type two cell activation, and this is showing you labeling for uh, the percent of uh, type two cells that are <clears throat> expressing KI67. KI67 is a gene that indicates uh, that, that your, the cell is inside the active in the cell cycle. Um, and so in control, you can see there's very little uh, activity of type two cells. And this is, makes sense because there's very slow turnover uh, without any injury. And then you see that by a half an hour, you have 5% that are active. And this peaks kind of at two hours or about 14% of uh, type two cells are active in the cell cycle. And then by 24 hours, it uh, has gone back down. Um, now, one thing that we noticed, which was uh, really interesting and a bit surprising is we noticed that when we stained for KI67 and the type two in red here and the type two marker, uh, NKX2.1 or TTF1 in green, we saw the appearance of these doublets, uh, KI67 positive doublets that uh, were pretty prominent uh, in the fields that we looked at. And um, so we thought, well, this is, <clears throat> A little unusual because usually um, entry and passage through the cell cycle can be a bit of a lengthy uh, process. And so we wouldn't think that in 30 minutes that the cell would have gone through the entire cell cycle, the S phase to re replicate its DNA, and then the M phase to undergo mitosis in such a rapid period of time. But in order to examine this, we uh, did another uh, test, which is we injected a thymidine analog uh, called EDU, uh, which is similar to experiments you may have heard of in the past uh, using BRDU or radio label thymidine. So this is a nucleic acid um, uh, substrate that is incorporated into the new DNA during uh, the S phase uh, of the cell cycle. And so you can identify cells that have gone through the S phase because they'll, they'll be positive uh, for this marker when you stain for it. And what we saw was, uh, again, very very interesting and surprising, we saw that these doublets, these KI67 positive doublets uh, were negative, entirely negative for EDU. So this indicated that uh, the, these cells <coughs> had uh, not entered the S phase. And so uh, they perhaps had, uh, you know, either they exist as binucleated cells that have not yet divided or they're cells that uh, have gone through the S phase, uh, sorry, that, uh, that have undergone cytokinesis cell division without uh, having gone through the S phase. And um, this is quantifying here. And you can see, again, that uh, at this two hour time point, the vast majority of the KI67 positive uh, type two cells that are in the cell cycle are EDU negative. So we looked actually at this point, we looked in the healthy lung and we asked, are there polyploid cells? And polyploidy is a really interesting uh, phenomenon in in, in many tissues, including in the human heart, there are many, many, many polyploid cells. And polyploid cells are cells that uh, they are one cell, but the nucleic acid content can, can be multiples of uh, normal. So normally you would have a 2N, you'd have two copies uh, of every uh, uh, chromosome, uh, but in polyploidy, this can be four or six or eight. Uh, and so it's an interesting, but not particularly well understood phenomenon. Now, in most cases, people think of polyploid cells as being uh, cells that screwed up cell division, that they, they, they aborted the cytokinesis, the final step of cell division, but it's not entirely clear whether they can be physiologically or functionally helpful. There's some data in the liver that polyploid hepatocytes, again, this is a tissue where ploidy is very common, uh, can divide and rapidly regenerate new cells. So this is an example in the mouse of what we think is a polyploid cell where you have two nuclei, but a single uh, 
uh, apical expression of MUC1, which is the type uh, two cell marker and surfactant protein C. And so it's sort of this biggish uh, cell. But we wanted to be a little bit more uh, confident and uh, do this quantitatively. So we did flow cytometry. And so with flow cytometry, you can stain with propidium iodide and you can look for uh, quantity of expression. And you can see here uh, in this healthy mouse that 96% uh, of the cells were diploid, uh, which is appropriate, uh, but about 3% uh, were polyploid. And when we looked at the cytospin here, you can see the membrane marker and the propidium iodide, you can see, in fact, these are binucleated cells. So then we went back to our injury and we asked, you know, are these polyploid cells that are uh, KI67 positive, which they are not at baseline, you know, are they also undergoing cytokinesis? And so here we stand for a protein called phosphohistone 3, which is an M phase specific marker. So it's expressed in cells that are uh, undergoing cytokinesis. And indeed, we saw that <coughs> these, uh, these doublets uh, that were alveolar type 2 cells were phosphohistone 3 and EDU negative. Uh, so we think this is uh, really interesting because it suggests that there's um, uh, another mechanism of regenerating uh, alveolar epithelial cells that is so rapid, you don't have to go all the way through the cell cycle. You have these, uh, res these polyploid uh, type two cells that hang around in the lung. And then when you lose a type uh, two cell from direct transdifferentiation, the polyploid cell can simply divide right away and re re reconstitute uh, the AT2 cell uh, population. <clears throat> okay, now going back to the, uh, you know, the, the, the initial model is that type two stem cells proliferate and then uh, the progeny can regenerate type one cells or remain as type two cells. We looked at, uh, at the EDU positive cells, which would be this, we think the stem cells. And so you can see here that uh, all of the EDU positive cells, the ones that had entered the S phase, uh, they're, um, <clears throat> they're all singlets. Uh, and whereas uh, all the doublets are EDU negative are the ones that I was just talking about. And so here you can see a KI67 couple of doublets <clears throat> that are expressing TTF1 and are negative for EDU. And here you can see a different thing where you see a singlet, a KI67 positive type two cell that has incorporated EDU, so it's completed the S phase, but it hasn't yet uh, divided. And this is at a two hour time point. And sure enough, if we wait and we look at 12 hours after injury, we see the appearance of doublets uh, that have incorporated EDU. And so you can see here at an early time point, uh, you have only a singlet here that's <coughs> type two cell that's EDU positive. And then 12 hours, now you see EDU positive doublets. So these are the stem cells that have gone completely through the cell cycle and uh, duplicated and regenerated type two cells. Now, um, in order just to really make sure that it's not the stem cells, uh, we're not missing something that, uh, that they are not really rapidly proliferating or something like that. We asked, well, do we, if we block stem cell proliferation, uh, does this interfere with the, what we think is the direct transdifferentiation of non-stem cells? And so here, is a toxin uh, where you see is KS67 positive cells following toxin administration. But when we blocked cell proliferation in a couple of ways, one is by antagonizing Wnt signaling and the other is by blocking EGF receptor signaling. Uh, I don't have time to get into those, those mechanisms, but we think those are very important key factors for allowing proliferation of the stem cells. We can successfully block uh, uh, proliferation and activation of the stem cells um, but it does not impair the type 1 transdifferentiation. So you can see here in the toxin, uh, we've <clears throat> ablated the type 1 cells, but they're re rapidly regenerated. And here, even though we've reduced proliferation significantly with, by either antagonizing Wnt or uh, EGF receptor signaling, uh, we still regenerate all of the type 1 cells. So the story that uh, I basically want to leave you with is that you know, we have three distinct type 2 progenitors for acute repair. Uh, <clears throat> so the first responder is a non-stem cell. It's a type two cell that's not a stem cell. It doesn't activate K67, it doesn't proliferate. It just flattens and terminally gives itself up to make a new type one cell to cover up that uh, basement membrane. And then you've got a second wave, which is 
uh, the polyploid cells that undergo polyploidy reduction, they undergo cytokinesis and regenerate some of those type 2 cells that have been lost through transdifferentiation. And your final um, uh, group is the type 2 stem cells, which uh, self-duplicate and also regenerate uh, the type 2 cells that have been depleted through transdifferentiation. And we've done quantification, actually, and it looks like the stem cells that proliferate, they are pretty much exclusively generating type 2 cells because you get this an initial depletion of type 2 cells from the rapid transdifferentiation and the type 1 restoration is done by the time these stem cells have gotten to proliferate. So there's no need for more type 1 cells, at least with this one-time uh, killing. So, you know, I've always been interested, you know, as a pulmonologist, well, why does normal alveolar repair fail? You know, obviously acute lung injury and ARDS is a very important problem. Uh, you know, not only with COVID, but it's, it's always been a problem. And so, you know, why, why does, what goes wrong where you end up <clears throat> here? I'm showing you the early phase of uh, acute lung injury marked by AT1 cell death, uh, endothelial capillary junction leakiness. You can see these hyaline membranes here and fluid and protonaceous material in the alveolar lumen. And then in the later phase, you can end up with uh, alveolar type two cell hyperplasias alveolar septal thickening, uh, squamous metaplasia, and fibrosis. So how, wh what goes wrong here? So uh, we decided to do an experiment now where we would, rather than just killing all the type 1 cells at once, we would still keep the precision of just killing type 1 cells, but we would do multiple rounds of killing type 1 cells. And so for this, we use another similar genetic strategy where we would drive the Cree recombinase in type 1 cells, and then we would uh, express uh, a different construct here. So here, instead of the diphtheria toxin receptor, we actually express subunit A of the diphtheria toxin. And so this results in when we administer uh, tamoxifen to drive, activate the Cree recombinase, it will just immediately kill <clears throat> type one cells. It won't mark them. Um, and you don't need to add diphtheria toxin because it's producing it itself. And so this would allow us to give uh, multiple days of activation of the recombinase so that we would first kill the type one cells <clears throat> and they would be regenerated by type two cells that flattened. And then those type two cells, because they form type one cells, they would start, they would be expressing this type one gene hop X. And so when we give another round of tamoxifen, we then kill those newly transdifferentiated type one cells and we can do this, you know, so on and so on and do, and do multiple rounds of killing to, to simulate a more um, aggressive injury. Although again, we're limiting it just to killing the type one cells so that we can you know, do our best to make sense of it. So <clears throat> uh, these results were, were quite surprising to us. What we found is that if we looked after just one round of killing, you can see here uh, mucin one or muc one is marking these uh, normal appearing uh, type uh, two cells uh, and you know, we've killed the type one cells, they've been replaced and, and the type two cells have been replaced. But if we ablate over multiple days, uh, we see uh, one thing that's obvious is the squamous type two cell metaplasia. So this is kind of weird. We see MUC1 continues to be expressed on the surface of these cells that have flattened. So in this case, unlike with that first round of ablation uh, where MUC1 rapidly goes away, these cells have flattened uh, to some degree. We don't know if they're exactly as big as type one cells or not. Uh, so they've really undergone this dramatic change in their morphology, but they're still expressing MUC1, so they haven't really um, uh, differentiated. Um, and we also see areas of significant hyperplasia where we see uh, dense collections of MUC1 positive uh, cuboidal cells that are inappropriately dense and, uh, and, and there's way too many of them. So we were very surprised because, um, you know, we were not really honestly expecting this uh, and it doesn't, it's obviously not a very adaptive uh, situation uh, where you have flattened cells, but they are not fully type one cells molecularly. And then you've got an excess of epithelial cells. <clears throat> um, when we also stained for potoplanin, we did see that you know, there was a lot of type one cell areas that had regenerated, but 
these flat Mach 1 cells, they really only express very low levels, if any, of um, protoplanin compared to the, the type 1 cells that, had, that don't express protoplanin. So again, they're retaining uh, Mach 1, and they're not quite turning on uh, protoplanin, which is the type 1 uh, marker gene. <clears throat> so just to summarize everything here, uh, we've shown that initially in this alveolar repair from ablation of type 1 cells, you get the first step, this direct transdifferentiation of type 2 cells to regenerate those type 1 cells in this uh, very rapid and gap-free manner, followed by ploidy reduction, where the <clears throat> binucleated type 2 cells can, can divide pretty rapidly. And then by that time, the self-duplication passage through the entire cell cycle can kick in and regenerate the type 2 cells that were lost from transdifferentiation. But then <clears throat> with sustained type 1 killing, for whatever reason, we, you know, we get this pathology that in some ways re resembles some features of uh, ARDS, where you have hyperplasia of uh, type 2 cells <clears throat> in clusters that are cuboidal. And then you also have these sort of metaplastic uh, squamous metaplasia of uh, type 2 cells, where they are kind of co-expressing type one and type two cell markers. And so, you know, it's quite, quite interesting why, why this should occur because, uh, you know, I think uh, the way I've been thinking about it is that, you know, there's a prioritization of covering the basement membrane and having a, a complete epithelial barrier that's prioritized at the expense of properly managing the number of cells and, uh, and or the differentiation status of the cells. And so, um, you know, maybe this is just a property of, of the lung, which, you know, is really, uh, it's a special kind of epithelium because it can't, uh, it doesn't, it has to maintain the barrier function. And yet it's just a very simple and delicate and vulnerable epithelium. So, um, so this work uh, was done by Josh Guild, who's a really talented um, MD PhD student uh, in the lab. And Josh started out actually, he was the very first uh, Paul Berg scholar at Stanford. And uh, then his work was going so well, his committee encouraged him to <clears throat> go for a full PhD. Uh, and he's recently been awarded a F30 uh, uh, award from the NIH for his work. And I'd like to acknowledge my funding sources. And uh, uh, Josh was helped quite a bit from Andy Andalon, who's a technician in the lab who helped with a lot of the mouse work and, uh, and Nick and Matt and Courtney have, uh, have helped him as well. So with that, I'll end and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for your attention. Uh, that was an amazing talk uh, and gave us a lot of uh, foundational uh, uh, science that really can help understand lung injury. Um, I have uh, a couple questions that have popped up. Uh, the first comes from uh, Irv Wiseman. Tushar, great new fundamental basic discovery. In the post-diphtheria treatment, can you see an asymmetric distribution of proteins or RNAs encoding them to two daughter cells, one AT1 and the other mononuclear AT2? Right. Uh, yeah, thanks, sir. That's a great question. You know, we often wondered, uh, even with just the aging, um, is there um, asymmetric division or asymmetric just outcomes? And when, whenever we've observed uh, dividing type 2 cells, kind of caught them in the middle of undergoing mitosis during aging, we haven't seen that many because it doesn't happen very frequently. There always looks to be symmetric uh, expression of the type 2 marker gene and morphologically the cells appear to be very symmetric, but that's, you know, that's a small sample size. Uh, here, when we've looked, when we see the, <clears throat> either the binucleated cells that divide uh, or the EDU positive doublets, um, we don't see type one generation uh, in, in that case. Now with a repeated diphtheria toxin, we haven't, this is pretty new information. So we, we need to look carefully at that. I think that's a, it's a great question. Um, so, so far we haven't seen any evidence of asymmetric cell division, but it's not that we've done a good job looking for that yet. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Levy, Ron Levy asks, which if any of these cells express the A2, uh, oh, the question just disappeared. Um, it, uh, let me just, it, yeah, I'm sorry. Which if any of these uh, cells express the ACE2 receptor? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I think uh, 
So we've done a little bit of work on COVID in collaboration with Calvin Quo's lab. And what we found is that uh, AT2 cells do not really get infected. It's a very small proportion. If you look at single cell RNA-seq data sets, and we've done a little bit of staining, maybe 1% of type two cells express ACE2. So to me, how you get ARDS and acute lung injury from COVID is a complete mystery because there's, you know, I don't think there's any good evidence from, uh, other people have tried to infect type two cells as well. And they've, they've you know, found that they don't really get infected by COVID, at least in these uh, in vitro assays that they, that they use. And there's, there's not really a population that expresses ACE2. So I think it's a big, that, that to me, that's the fundamental mystery of COVID, you know, about and, and acute lung injuries. Why do you get acute lung injury when you're not infecting and killing your type two cells? Good question. Great. Um, I'm going to go down just one because I'm, I'm interested too. Kevin Grimes asks, in, in your diphtheria toxin model, there was no apparent inflammatory response to the acute cell injury. What accounts for this? Yeah. So in the <clears throat> one-time ablation, we don't see much inflammation. And that, that was part of the reason we thought, geez, are we even killing the cells? Because the mice were not having any signs of distress and we didn't see much of an inflammation. On EM, we can see that there are some macrophages, but I believe that there's very little inflammation because the epithelium is restored just immediately. So whatever signals are saying that, hey, there's an epithelial break and we, we need an inflammatory cell influx, that's, that's not being presented. Also, we're not killing endothelial cells. So it's quite different from you know, a normal injury where you might kill a type one and an endothelial cell and have an influx of inflammation. When we do the repeated toxin, we see massive inflammation. There's tons, I didn't, I meant to point it out in one of the slides, but there's tons of alveolar macrophages and things don't look happy and the mice are very, very sick. So. Great, okay. Our, uh, Joe Levitt has asked, great talk Tushar. At what stage of lung injury and why do we see proliferation of hyaline memories? Hyaline membranes, sorry. Yeah, this is a great question. And that's a feature that uh, we haven't, we, we need to do the, the stain, the ESN stain to look for the presence or absence of hyaline membranes. Um, and, but to me, it's not obvious that we have anything that looks like hyaline membranes. In the repeated uh, diphtheria toxin ablation experiments where you know, the alveolar structure looks very abnormal and we have this hyperplasia, <clears throat> um, uh, we need to stain and see if there's hyaline membranes. I think I was reading about this and I guess hyaline membranes is really attributed to the proteinaceous capillary leak. And so it could be that if we're not getting enough denudation or, or we're not killing uh, damaging endothelial cells, maybe we're getting the epithelial problems without the capillary leak and therefore not the hyaline membranes. But I think we need to really look closely and maybe even do some more severe injuries and see. Uh, we're actually planning on doing some injuries where we do the type one ablation and endothelial ablation. And perhaps that will reveal something like hyaline membranes. Um, I'd like to combine a question that I had with what uh, Naomi Haddock is asking. My question for you was going to be, your science here is very foundational, right? It's really important. Um, and uh, it's in mice, which are perhaps less complicated with less, comp with less complicated exposures. My question was going to be, and then I'm gonna read Naomi's, um, how can you go about proving these foundational principles in humans? Now, let me read Naomi Haddock's question, which is, um, thanks for a great talk. Very interesting findings. Have you looked at human lung sections for these polyploid AT2 cells? And is there any anticipated difference in abundance or function in human lung? How would you expect these cells be affected in a chronic inflammation environment such as cystic fibrosis? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So yeah, we, you know, we, we try to do everything in human that we can possibly do. <laughs> and, and, you know, initially I started out, we, we were really doing everything in mice, but now we've started to do human lung slice cultures. Uh, and we're really high on these because I think we, we also do spheroid cultures of human type two cells. And we've shown that they, they are stem cells uh, in human as they are in mice. And also Wnt seems to have the same uh, activity in human 
type two cells as it does in, in mice that it's required for their EGF driven proliferation. Um, but I think the lung slice cultures will be a way to, um, to try to answer some of these questions. And we're, we're actually gearing up to do, to set up a suite of lentiviral constructs that we can <clears throat> infect human lung slice cultures with to look at specific questions like do lineage tracing of type two cells over the short term uh, in a lung slice culture. So I'm hoping to get some of that, you know, try to translate some of this and see if it holds up. In terms of um, the human and binucleated cells and chronic inflammation, you know, this is pretty new. So we're trying to, um, you know, send this out for publication pretty soon. And, but, I, but that's exactly what we're interested in, you know, is, is, is this biology also relevant uh, for human uh, lung? And in chronic inflammation, you know, I'm not sure. I guess I would think of chronic inflammation maybe as, I, I just don't know if the inflammatory signals that are there, let's say, because you have a chronic, you know, bronchiectasis or something, you know, are those signals, <clears throat> do they overlap and to what degree with pro-proliferative signals? You know, like, so you see uh, epithelial hyperplasia in ARDS where, you know, so there's some kind of pro-proliferative signal that's too much, uh, but in diseases like bronchiectasis, fibrosis, I think you don't see this excessive proliferation, just, you know, at least superficially. So I think we, I just need to think about this a lot more and then hopefully we can, you know, test some of this stuff in not only healthy lung, but in disease lung, you know, including lung cancer, cystic fibrosis, et cetera. Great. Uh, Professor Levy has a second question. Which of these cells makes the protein in PAP, which is protein alveolar proteinosis, when GMCSF is ablated? Maybe you can explain that to our general audience, what, what the question means. Yeah, sure. So, sorry, just to make sure the question, the question is which makes what? The... Which, which makes the protein in uh, alveolar proteinosis, PAP, Gotcha. And, okay. And when when is GMCSF ablated? Yeah, perfect. When, yeah, so, when, when GMCSF is ablated. Sorry. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, PAP or pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is a really interesting and rare disease where uh, it's a defect in recycling of surfactant phospholipid. So normally, what happens is type two cells, alveolar type two cells, including the stem cells, we think they contain these lamellar bodies of phospholipid and surfactant protein, and they keep um, uh, ejecting it into the alveolar lumen in the airspace. And so you form a monolayer called tubular myelin that reduces surface tension. Now, normally in a healthy lung, uh, the surfactant is subsequently eaten by macrophages. And then these macrophages uh, re recycle the surfactant, the phospholipid to the alveolar type two cells. So you have this loop where the macrophages eat it and then they give it back to the type two cells. In pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, which has been associated with a deficiency in GMCSF or antibodies against GMCSF, what happens is that the macrophages don't mature. So that GMCSF is necessary for the monocytes to mature into macrophages that are capable of eating uh, surfactant phospholipid and recycling it. And so that fails to happen. So you break the circuit and you just keep, the type two cells keep putting out surfactant but there's no ingestion by macrophages and no recycling. So it just accumulates in the alveoli. So the relevant cell really is the type two cell, but the pathologic cell is that the macrophage didn't mature. And so you, you no longer clear it, but you keep producing it. Great. Um, Dr. Greenberg asks, uh, he, he states uh, T regulatory cells, T regs are critical for a control of systemic inflammation. Are these cells deficient in the lung as a means of the deficient inflammatory response in this setting? That's a great question. You know, we, we need to, we've really just so far focused on the epithelial response and just kind of looked at the number of inflammatory cells. We do see that even with the one-time uh, diphtheria toxin ablation, there's a large number of uh, cells that become active in the cell cycle and uh, express KI-67 or take up EDU that are inflammatory cells. Um, we haven't done anything so far to, to look at these, but I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an important question. People have certainly shown that uh, macrophages are really important for epithelial regeneration. When you do a pneumonectomy in a mouse, if you, the lung cannot re recruit macrophages, you really get uh, very little epithelial proliferation. So they definitely have a role. We haven't looked, 
I just I wouldn't call the um, the one time ablation. I wouldn't say that that's a, a defect of inflammation. I would just say that inflammatory cells are apparently not <clears throat> not recruited or not needed because you don't have any epithelial damage. You know because you restore it in this gap free, very rapid manner. That's our hypothesis anyway. Great. Well, I think we're right at the top of the hour. I have about three more questions, but I'm going to ask them to you offline. Um, wonderful talk. Really appreciate it, uh, Tushar. And I think all of us uh, appreciate the time. Bob, did you uh, want to say anything? Uh, I just want to congratulate Tushar on an outstanding body of work and still at a very young age. So uh, thanks for everything you're doing, Tushar. And uh, this was a fantastic medical grand rounds. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and really congratulate Josh uh, Guild when you see him. <laughs> I know Mark, you're on his committee, but, you know, this is really, he in independently would come to me and give me a mini heart attack once a week saying, hey, I found some binucleated cells. <laughs> so anyway, thanks, everyone, for your attention and your questions. I really appreciate it.